The book of Revelation, chapter 13, verse 16, says that he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hands or in their foreheads. Are you ready for the mark of the beast? The time to get ready is now. A thousand years before there was a Protestant, there were Sunday laws that originated in pagan sun worship. For centuries, the church ruled the world until the Protestant Reformation. Men like Martin Luther championed personal and religious freedom. Thousands fled to America to seek freedom from religious tyranny. Will Protestants and freedom-loving Americans fight to keep freedom alive, or will we descend into a modern dark age? The Sunday Law Crisis, what you need to know. Episode 2, Getting Ready Spiritually. Welcome back to part two of the Sunday Law Crisis, What You Need to Know. In part one, we talked about many headlines that talk about Sunday observance and how uh, the issue of Sunday versus Sabbath is being agitated right now around the world. Here's one article I read from the Associated Press, July 6, 2014. The title is called, Keeping Stores Open on Sunday is not beneficial for society, says Pope Francis. Uh, Pope Francis' opinion is becoming quite popular. Uh, his visit to America and all of the uh, media coverage surrounding his encyclical that came out in June of 2015, uh, he is putting his weight in favor of enforcing Sunday. The movement for Sunday legislation is growing right now around the world. As we talked about this in our last program, part one, I read a quotation that is very shocking to many, but it is a fact. This came from the famous Cardinal Gibbons, November 11, 1895, which says, of course, the Catholic Church claims that the change from the Bible Sabbath into Sunday was her act, and the act is a mark of her ecclesiastical authority in religious matters. There's another statement I read in part one from the Lord's Day Alliance of the U.S. That's Promoting Sunday Observance, April 2015. The title was called Sunday as a Mark of Christian Unity. Whitehorse Media has a little pocketbook called Decoding the Mark of the Beast that looks at history, looks at prophecy, looks at the Sabbath Sunday issue, and shows very clearly that the Bible teaches, and here are the, here's one of the tables of stone. The fourth commandment written by God himself says, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy, and the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord. The Bible is very clear that God wrote his law with his own finger on stone and it's the seventh day and that Sunday is the first day of the week which is purely a tradition of men as a day of worship that has replaced the Bible Sabbath. So we're here to continue talking about these issues and about the Sunday law crisis and to help you to get ready for what is coming upon the earth. Today I am here with uh, Dean Corridan. Dean, thank you for being here, and I see you have a White Horse Media shirt, uh, but you're actually not employed by White Horse Media. You are our guest, and you are the uh, president of the Iowa-Missouri Conference of Seventh-day Adventists, Sabbath keepers that well, believe right. in the Bible and who believe in Jesus. That's right. And uh, it's a blessing to have you, and our focus today is the, the spiritual preparation so that we can get ready. So just talk to us, and we'll bounce off each other, and uh, trust that God will bless us. Well, it's interesting, Steve, that God gives us so much information in Bible prophecy of things that are coming and that we can see it happen. But it's also equally interesting to know that God gives us a lot of information of how to be ready for the crisis that's ahead of us or for the second coming of Jesus. In fact, in Matthew chapter 24 and 25, when it is one of the great passages of Scripture of here's the things you should look for and here's the things that will happen and then you will know that my coming is near, God says, therefore you also, in verse 44 of chapter 24, therefore you also be ready. That's right. I've got that un circled right there in my Bible, be ready. So the concept of readiness is important to the Bible. The concept of being ready and getting ready is very important to the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in Matthew chapter, end of 24 through 25, just before the second coming, God gives three parables to believers and to non-believers 
to prepare them to be ready for the second coming. That's right, and, and for the final crisis. And, and for the and, final and crisis it's, it's also. Sad. It's sad, we've talked about this in previous White Horse Media programs that there's a lot of Christians out there that believe we're just gonna be raptured out of here before the trouble starts and the mark of the beast comes and, and they're not getting ready for the final crisis because they don't think they'll be here. That's but right. we, we believe that's a massive misinterpretation of prophecy that Revelation 13, the two beasts uh, are here and the mark of the beast is pending and God wants us to get ready to stand during the final crisis. That's exactly right. The three parables, uh, just quickly, is the parable of the faithful and the evil servant from uh, chapter 24, verse 45 to 51. Then the beginning of the chapter 25 is the parable of the wise and foolish virgins from 1 to 13 virgins. And then from 14 to 30 is the parable of the talents. These are three parables that Jesus gives us to focus on the whole concept of spiritual readiness for His coming. That's right. It's important to know the facts and the events, but we need more than that. We have to know, we have to know God. We have to know Jesus. We have to get spiritually ready. Yeah, and the way He even opens up the first parable of the faithful servant and the evil servant in verse 45 of chapter 24, it is, Who then is a faithful and wise servant? That is the question that should be asked today. Right, faithful and wise servants. When we see the things that are being pointed out in prophecy, the question that should come to everybody's mind then is, who's going to be ready? Who is the faithful servant? What's the faithful servant look like? Who is the evil servant? That's the question Jesus asked. Good point. These parables then begin to deal with it. So the first, the first point of who is the faithful servant, he talks about a household. He talks about a household where people are involved. And he contrasts the good servant with the evil servant. The evil servant in verse 48 is identified, but if that evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming and begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunkards. Mm -hmm. So the identification of the evil servant is the person who does not live his life in any consideration that Jesus is coming yeah, again. He, he probably believes Jesus is coming at some point, but it says, he, he, my Lord delays his coming. That's right. So he puts it far into the future. And so he does not adjust his life. He mistreats the people around him. Right. And when it says he eats and drinks with the drunkard, that is a reference to investing his interest with the interest of the world. Wow. Yeah, I've, I've also looked at that and thought drunkards, Revelation uh, 14 talks about Babylon that makes the world drunk with its wine. And so those people that are also eating and drinking with the drunkards, they're, they're drinking the wine of Babylon and they're not really following Jesus and the Bible closely. That's right. So in this first parable, it would seem to me as men, as believers, and to everybody, but since we're talking as men and believers, if we really believe these things that we're talking about here, it ought to make me a better husband. Right. It ought to make me a better father. Yes. It ought to make me a better worker, that I'm kind and considerate and respectful of the people around me. That's the mark of a faithful servant. Yeah. Somebody who lives life to make life better for others. Yes, wow. The first identification. Well, let me just also quickly mention, I've, I've th thought a lot about this too, that one of the characteristics of the faithful and wise servant in verse, in verse 45 is that he gives food to his household in due season. They give the people what they need, especially as we get ready for a crisis. God wants his people to give others what they really need. That's when why they the, need it. Yes, that's why this uh, series is called The Sunday Law Crisis, What You Need to Know. That's We're trying right. to be faithful and wise servants, giving the people what they need. So it would seem like one of the great testimonies of the Christian church in the world today, if we believe the crisis is in front of us, would be giving a demonstration to unbelievers of a peaceful life, of happy homes, adjusted, well-adjusted churches, treating each other with courtesy and respect. Wonderful. The second parable, which is a very familiar parable, is called the parable of the wise and foolish virgins. In this parable, God demonstrates, Jesus demonstrates that the virgins who represent the church, who represent believers, are going to a wedding feast. There's a, a great excitement and a great joy, but when they get to the wedding feast, there seems to be a delay. 
and all of them go to sleep. Mm -hmm. They are unaware. But in the parable, it says that a word goes out, something arouses them, they Makes wake them up. up and say, wow, this is all really happening. Right. Uh, the bridegroom really is coming. He is coming. Let's the events are happening, just like we were told. But the difference then is, even though they all went to sleep and they all woke up, something happened in that time frame that began to separate and divide them. Because the Bible is very clear that when five of them woke up, they trimmed their lamps, they had oil to light their lamp, to be a witness, to be ready, but five had woken up, their lamps had gone out, they had no oil to trim and light. That's right, and isn't the oil a symbol in the Bible of the Holy Spirit? Symbol of the Holy Spirit. The first great lesson we need to learn from that is this. Nobody can provide the Holy Spirit for anybody. Only Jesus can gift the Holy Spirit. That's right. And the, the foolish virgins, I've studied this a lot too, they, they go through the motions. They believe in Jesus coming, the bridegroom coming. They've got their lamps. They believe in the Bible. But the oil of the Holy Spirit is missing in their vessels, which represent their lives. That's and then exactly when the crisis right. hits, they all wake up. And the foolish virgins realize that the oil isn't there. They're not connecting with God like they, they thought they could do. And they, they're, they're missing something. So they go to the wise. They say, give us your oil. Our lamps are going out. And the wise say, we can't. We can't because we can't give you the experience that we have. That's right. Isn't it interesting that there's so much teaching in the world today of second chances and other opportunities. But in the parable that Jesus himself gave us, when the call comes, there is no second chance. We're either ready or we're not that's ready. That's right. Yeah, that's exactly. That's what I've been impressed with too. Verse 10 says that those who were ready went in with him to the wedding and the door was shut. So the bottom line is we need to have the Holy Spirit now. We need to be wise virgins now. So when the crisis hits, we can't think that we can just get ready during that time. I heard a preacher once say that crisis does not develop character. It only reveals it. No, it reveals good. what's there. So we need to have an experience with Jesus now and get ready so that when the issues hit, then we are ready to deal with them, to trust Jesus, and He's going to bring us through. Sometimes when people read the parable of the wise and foolish virgins, they will ask questions like, well, how does a person get the Holy Spirit? I mean, what do we have to do? I mean, is there some great effort, or is there some great work, or is there something we need to earn? But Jesus was very clear on this when He was on the earth, and He taught very clearly that if we need the Holy Spirit, all we need to do is simply ask, mm -hmm. and He will give it to us as quickly as a father would give food or water to a hungry that's or thirsty right. Luke, child. Luke 13, 11. I think that's the text. So the, so the defining mark between the wise virgin and the foolish virgin is this. Even when it seems they're asleep, five are asking of the Father, of Jesus, a gift of the Holy Spirit, and five are not. That's right. And the Holy Spirit, Jesus called him the Spirit of truth, who guides us into truth, and his word is truth, and we need the Holy Spirit now to bring us into the truth. Every of day. Let's, uh, our time is moving rapidly. Quickly, the third parable. There's the third parable there. is quickly is the parable of the talents, and basically God gives talents or gifts of ability to three of his servants and tells them he's coming back. He gives five talents to one, two talents to another, one talent. What becomes the defining uh, feature of Jesus saying, well done? It wasn't the amount of talents, nor was it the amount of return. It was that somebody did something for Jesus in preparing. Somebody did something. Then two did something, and God said, Well done, good and faithful servant. One servant said, Well, I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to bury my talent. It is that servant that God said, You are a slothful servant. You did nothing to help somebody else to get ready. We need to be kind, first parable. We need to be alert, asking heaven for the gift of the Holy Spirit through truth and the Word of God, second parable. Good. Third parable, we need to be helping others. We need to invest in others to help them be ready That's for the right. second Use coming. Use our gifts and talents to help spread the Word and help other people 
to know Jesus as well. That's right. We need to be real practical Christians. That's right. That's right. Now, let's, let's shift and let's go to Revelation chapter 14. As I've looked at the third angel's message and the whole issue of the mark of the beast, the beast, the image, the mark, described in Revelation 14, 9 to 12, at the end of verse 11 talks about those who receive the mark of his name. So there's the mark of the beast mentioned in Revelation 14, 11. And then verse 12 says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are, the, are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. These are the people that are described in Revelation as being on the opposite side of the beast and the mark. We've got the beast and the mark group, and then we have the keepers of the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus group. And it seems to me the part of our, or a huge part of our spiritual preparation, if not the, the sum total of our preparation, which then branches out in different areas, using our talents, etc., is to become commandment keepers and have the faith of Jesus. And I've, I've mentioned these before. I carry these around sometimes when I go to uh, seminars and I hold up the, the two tables in front of audiences. And I have been deeply convicted, uh, Elder, Elder Corridan, that that this is a time that we're living in that the Holy Spirit wants to show us each commandment mm -hmm. and go deep into our hearts and show us where we are breaking God's law. And, and he wants to bring us to the cross and to, it says, the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, that Jesus is the only one that can cleanse us from sin That's through right. his blood that and save right. us by his grace. And we want to make it very clear as we've been talking about Protestant Catholic issues that we are Protestants through and through That's right. and that we do not believe in salvation by keeping the law. Through the law, we believe in salvation by the grace of Jesus mm -hmm. who then writes the law into our hearts through his power and then enables us as the fruit of our faith in Him to become commandment keepers to keep all ten, including the fourth. Amen. Steve, when you say that, it just reminds me that in the book of Daniel, chapter 9, verse 7, when Daniel is praying for wisdom and help from God, he says, O oh Lord, all righteousness belongs to you. That's right. And what you just said reminded me that we don't earn righteousness. We don't earn readiness. Righteousness is a gift of God, and He yes. promises to give it to us. Readiness is a gift of God, and Jesus says that He has engraved us on the palms of His hands, and if we will rest in Him, He will never let us go. He is well able to get every man, woman, and child from this sinful world into the new kingdom. That's right. Pr praise His name. As I look again at this text, the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. In history, many have focused on the commandments, like the Pharisees, but they neglected Jesus. Other people focus on Jesus, but they want nothing to do with the commandments. Right. They say Jesus saves us and the law is gone. But the, the third angel's message in Revelation 14, 12, that warns about the beast and the mark and the crisis that we're heading into, puts the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus together and as I mentioned in the last program, I've pondered this a lot and I've concluded that the finger that wrote the law was mm -hmm. on the hand, on the hands that were nailed to the cross. Wow. Uh, especially the fourth commandment that points to, to the Creator. The Sabbath, the seventh day Sabbath points to our Creator. And when you look at the New Testament, Jesus is our Creator. Uh, John right. 1 verse 3 says all things were made by Him. John 1.10 says He was in the world, the world was made by Him, and the world didn't know Him. And so when you put the pieces together, the one that gave us the law and gave us the Sabbath to point to Him as the Creator, He's the one that sacrificed Himself on, in Gethsemane and on the cross for our sins. Wow. And it's the revelation of His grace and His love and the Creator's suffering and the forgiveness that comes from Him alone and salvation from Him alone that He saves us from sin, changes our lives, and because we love Him, we then want to become commandment keepers, like Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And that's the kind of people that the Lord is preparing well, spiritually. His preparation says not only did He write it on a table of stone, but Old Testament and New Testament makes it clear 
that he writes his law on our hearts. That's right. He will do that for us. So he will cause us to walk in his ways. He will provide the righteousness. He will provide obedience in our everyday life. We can be ready. That's right. And, and as I, my, part of my, my personal preparation, I've looked at the first commandment, no other gods before God. And I've searched my heart and let the Holy Spirit search my heart and show me where I've violated that commandment. Amen. And then Jesus cleansed me. Amen. The second commandment, no idols. Have I had idols in my life? And if I have, Lord, forgive me, cleanse me. And the third commandment, now don't take God's name in vain. Have I done that? Lord, forgive me, cleanse me. Where I've broken the Sabbath, where I haven't uh, honored my father and my mother. Number seven, where I've uh, committed murder, although I haven't actually killed anybody. But Jesus said, if you hate someone in your heart, it's, it's, it's murder. And Lord, have I done that? Do I hate anybody? Uh, forgive me. Jesus, cleanse me. Number seven, don't commit adultery. That's a huge one. Mm. Uh, dealing with sexual purity. Especially not just, today. Yeah, not just inside of marriage, but outside. When people aren't married yet, wait till you get married. Uh, marriage is between a man and a woman, biblically. And uh, men need to be careful of their minds. When we're clicking around on the internet, uh, God wants our minds to be pure and clean. And if we've broken that law, now's the time for us to say, Lord, cleanse me, forgive mm, me. That's right. Jesus, save me. Uh, number eight, don't steal. Number nine, don't lie. Don't bear false witness. Number 10, don't covet. And Jesus summarized the, the big 10 in the big two to love God with your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength and your neighbor as yourself. And, and I tell you, uh, Dean, I'm totally convinced that the Holy Spirit is moving to convict people one by one of their breaking of all the commandments right. to then point them to Jesus and his forgiveness and his grace and his power so Jesus can forgive us, change us, write the law in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that the wise virgins have, that same Holy Spirit in the book of Hebrews, it says, the Spirit says, I'll write my law in your heart. And then we will become commandment keepers because we love God. And that's the way to be ready. You have for just the described every faithful person in all three parables. Wow. So they go, they merge together. They merge together. They merge together. Yeah, one thing I've also been convicted about, uh, and I think it's safe to say this, that uh, I think about the, the uh, tragedy of Bill Cosby, mm. uh, one of the most beloved American comedians of all time. And the evidence I think is pretty overwhelming that uh, he had some huge skeletons in his closet and that they, they came out. And we need to pray for Bill, pray that he'll come clean and that God will, because he still loves him. God loves us all. But the point, and the reason why I say that is because I've just been impressed that we cannot afford to have any skeletons we in our closet. As we go into the final crisis, those skeletons must be confessed before the crisis hits. And we've got to let Jesus take all the skeletons out so we can go into the crisis clean and, and pure, trusting Jesus as real commandment keepers who are ready to give the third angel's message with a loud voice. He promises to wash us with his word. He promises that if we'll yield to him and obey him, we will be clean and ready when he comes. So God's preparing a people right now, isn't he? Right now. He's getting us ready. He's getting us ready spiritually. And if a person feels like so much time has gone by, it is not too late. God can work in a moment for us. We need to decide today. Today's the day of salvation. That's right. And we can't afford to wait. Cannot wait. I think wait. a lot of people think, well, when the final crisis hits, then I'll get ready. And it just doesn't happen that way. We've got, to, right. have, we've got to have that preparation right now. One thing also I want to share, we've got a, about three more minutes left. Uh, I've been deeply convicted about how the third angel's message talks about those who get the mark of the beast and those who get the mark will, will drink the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. And I've looked at the word cup, that cup and it's taken me back to the Garden of Gethsemane mm. where Jesus wrestled with a cup and said, Father, if it's possible, take this cup from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And that, that in that cup was the wine of the wrath of God, unmixed with mercy. And when we really understand that Jesus took the wrath of God, that's described in the third angel's message, he took it before he gave the message. And that uh, the suffering that he went through was for us. He took our justice so he could give us his mercy. And I've just been so moved. I preach on this too. 
I've been so moved by this that if we really understand the sufferings that Jesus went through to take our sins of breaking the Ten Commandments, that he suffered without a drop of mercy falling upon him in the garden, that that should move us, move us like nothing else can to, to pray the same prayer that Jesus prayed, to, to pray, not my will, but your will be done. If ever there's a day to say yes to Jesus, it's today. That's right, and that, is a, that, was, a, that was a full surrender Jesus made, full surrender to his Father's will. And I, I'm convinced that the only way that we can truly be ready for Jesus' coming is to make that full surrender to God, to his love, to his word, and to his truth now before the crisis comes. Oh, well said, well said. So that's where, that's where we are, and uh, God's getting the people ready, and we, we certainly want to stress the fact that the information that we're sharing in this series, The Sunday Law Crisis, What You Need to Know, the, this information is not human opinion. The saddest words in the scripture ever said is the summer is ended, the harvest is past, and we are not saved. The happiest words in the scripture are when Jesus says, well done, good and faithful servant. That's right, and to be a good and faithful servant is to follow scripture. Uh, we don't want to follow the beast. We don't want to follow the image of the beast. The, the image of the beast says it's duplicated. We don't want to get the mark of the beast in our foreheads or in our, our hands, our actions. We want to follow Jesus Christ all the way and be part of the people that are described here in the Word of God. Friend, this is the Word of God. This is not man's opinion. These are not human traditions that we're, we're telling you. We're telling you what God says and what God wrote with his own finger on stone. And the ultimate issue at the end of time is are we going to follow the Bible? Are we going to follow Jesus? Or are we going to follow the beast and get the mark? Those are the issues that are revealed in the book of Revelation. So we just appeal to you from our hearts uh, based on scripture that you will choose to be among the people described here in God's word. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Let's get ready now.